Hi, welcome back to CMSC A2080 Vision Planning and Control in Aerial Robotics. Today we'll be talking about one of the most important topics which you would need to control a quad rotor, which is quad rotor controls itself. So let's dive right into it. So let's start with the higher level picture. So let's say you have a we have a quad rotor as shown in the figure, and we would want to follow a trajectory RT as shown here and it's a time parameterized quantity so that's basically there are different poses you would want to achieve with respect to time as shown by the red uh, sorry as shown by the black trajectory path here and uh, we have the body fixed frame as shown and we have something called as r desired which is basically the desired value which would be the output of a controller which we'll be talking about during the end of the lecture and r is basically the current position that is what is shown here the red vector denotes the error with respect to the trajectory we want and that's the higher level picture which we would dive into deriving the equations for controls and so on before we talk about controls we need to talk about a more basic quantity let's talk about something called as a root locus plot or pole zeros in the root locus plot it's a plot of some system parameters which discusses how unstable or stable a system could be and we'll talk about it in the next slide so the idea here is it's a very messy plot bear with me for a second the idea here is that we have the real axis on the x-axis and we have the imaginary axis on the y-axis and this diagram is called the s-plane s-plane is analogous to the frequency domain in Fourier analysis, but it's slightly different. I'm not going going into the mathematical details, but just remember that this is called S plane with the horizontal being real and vertical being imaginary axis. So focus on the plot on the right side of the plane. So right side of the plane, anything with positive X is basically an unstable system. That means the output of the system diverges for any step input. And on the left side of the system, which is X being negative, the system is stable. That means the oscillations are decayed. And anything which is on dead on on the imaginary axis, that is X is equal to zero, will basically be a critically stable system or marginally stable system and would oscillate without decaying or, or diverging. Cool. Now, one of the most important things about this plot is basically anything which has an X is called a pole. Anything which has an O, which is not shown in this figure, will be a zero. And the way this moves will basically give us the root locus plot, which was shown in the previous slide. The idea here is that uh, as you move from the imaginary axis zero towards the left-hand side, the frequency of oscillation increases. And also, if the pole has some imaginary component which is it's not on the x is equal to zero axis it would always sorry which is not on the y is equal to zero axis that is the x axis it would always have some oscillation associated with it as shown here so if you look at the points on the real axis here you would see that there is no oscillation it's just a decay for the left hand side and just a exponential increase for the right hand side and any other pair of poles which are shown with dotted lines here are exist as complementary pairs and they have an oscillation associated with it and that's the general essence of this uh, uh, this uh, s-plane diagram or pole zero diagram or root locus root locus is just the way the poles and zeros would move with respect to different changes in the system and one more thing we have to mention again is the left hand side of the system of the y axis is stable, right hand side is unstable and dead on on the imaginary axis would be critically stable. And also note that adding any time delay to the system, that is if you're controlling on let's say position in space and you have an estimator which estimates position, let's say it estimates with a small delay of like half a second, you're, un you're upsetting the system by pushing the poles to the right hand side. As you would observe from this figure, pushing the poles towards the right hand side would, would decrease the stability of the system. And if 
the poles move onto the right hand side of the system it would totally make it unstable that's the idea cool let's move on to the next basic topic which is an open loop system consider a simple system as shown here we have an input which feeds into a plant and which gives us some certain output which is called also called as the response right stimulus system response cool now the plant could be anything as simple as a simple thermostat control system a air conditioner or it can be something complex like a robot or a quad rotor in this case so more formally in math we would say the input is x of t as a time varying quantity and the plant has some response function g of t so that y of t would basically be the convolution of x and g cool in the time domain and in laplacian domain or in a way the frequency domain this could be written as capital x of s for the input capital g of x for the system response or units unit response or the delta response and or the impulse response in this case and y of s would capital y of s would be the output in the uh, laplacian domain so note that small letters mean that it's in time domain capital letters mean that it's in laplacian domain okay let's start with a simple open loop example so consider that the function g of x is given as follows uh note that i have not mentioned about small g of t here which could be simply obtained by inverting the laplace transform if you are not familiar with laplace transform please pause the video go look at how it's derived and how it's related to fourier transform and so on if you are familiar or more familiar with fourier transform if you are not familiar with both please go learn about the laplace transform and come back to the slide so i'm just going to move on because just for the sake of brevity here so g of x is given as follows as s, s plus 1 divided by s square plus s plus 4 and because it's an open loop system there is no feedback or anything and the total transfer function would just be g of s and the pole zero plot or the root locus plot for this system is shown on the left hand side know that anything which has an x here represents a pole which is basically where the denominator goes to zero or vanishes it's the value of s where denominator becomes zero that is denoted by an x here anything which is denoted by a zero or an o here is where the numerator vanishes or goes to zero so it's super easy so s is s plus 1 is equal to 0 as s is equal to minus 1 and this bottom part can be solved as a quadratic form like we used to solve in 8th grade and that's what is shown here now that the value of poles are shown in so just notice the value where they are uh, and we would see that later by making more feedbacks to the system we would basically push the poles towards the left hand side which is in turn going to make it more stable okay so now uh, let's talk about a closed loop system so we have the input and we have a measured error and this error is fed into the whole system which comprises of a controller and a plant and the output of the controller would be called as the controlled output and the total output would be the output response of the system and we would feed the output back in through some sensor because we are going to measure it through some sensor and we would basically feed the output of the sensor which is measured output into the input and the error would be computed as the difference between the input signal and the measured output signal so in this case you can think of input as some reference input like for an air conditioner it would be the reference temperature and the controller basically will be something which we would design the plant would be the room how room would react to changes in temperature and the output would be the temperature of the room and the feedback would basically be through some sensor which is the sensor could be simple thing like a thermostat or some temperature if we are fancy we are using some fancy sensor for it. and the measured output would be the actual measured temperature which would be fed into the input the idea here is that we just don't so to make something colder by let's say 1 degree celsius or 1 degree fahrenheit versus something by 10 degree celsius or 10 degree fahrenheit we don't crank our air conditioner all the way up which would in turn drive our bills crazy and and it wouldn't be good for our air conditioner because we are always maxing it out so the idea is we would scale it according to some function which would be determined by our controller 
So let's put this mathematically. The input is again x of t. The measured error is e of t. Let's call the output or the impulse response function of controller g1 of t for that of the plant g2 of t. And the control output would be u of t and the sensor feedback be h of t. So note that I mentioned the term impulse response here multiple times. Impulse response just means if we give a spike signal as the input to any of these blocks, what is the output I'm going to get? Basically, it talks about how it's analogous to the inertia of a physical system. So if you don't know what an impulse response means, please pause this video and go read about it from Wikipedia or any video. Cool. Let's move on. So this is the same figure from the previous slide. And this could also be written, we could combine G1 and G2 as a fun combined function G, which is G1 convolution with G2. Note that this are all in the time domain. I've just omitted the brackets T for brevity here. So let's convert the time domain signal into Laplace domain. As you would see, everything becomes capital. And note that convolution in the time domain becomes multiplication, simple multiplication in the Laplace domain. That's a property of Laplace transform. If you don't know about it, please go read about it and come back. So let's consider a particular type of closed loop feedback system. Let's make the capital H of S as unity. That is, we directly take the output and feed it back into the input. This is one of those cases wherein the sensor gives the exact same unit and scale as the input, which is not super common, but let's stick to this to make our lives a little bit easier and make the analysis super easy. Uh, note that there are methods which, uh, which exist in controls domain literature, which can take a non-unity gain system with HFS and convert it into, into a form wherein you can just convert it into unity feedback. So if you want to know more about it, you can go read about it later. Uh, that's not in the scope of this lecture, so I'm not going to be talking about it. Let's go back to the same example we had before. So G of S is again S plus 1 by S squared plus S plus 4. So total G total of S would basically be the forward transfer function of the whole system, which would basically start from X and encompass all this thing up to Y. And I'm going to replace this whole thing with G total of T, which I'm not shown here, but the idea is anything which is in green, the total thing is going to be replaced by one single block. And that's going to give us this output. And we would have G total as G divided by one plus T. If you don't know how this works, you can pause the video and go look at some simple a control system lecture, and this would be taught in any control system class. For now, you can just assume that I'm correct, and you can just take it for granted. And note that, so the poles have changed, and to make it more clear, so the G total is simplified as follows, of course, and the poles are not the same because the, the bottom part of the transfer function for G of S and G total of S is not the same like it was in the open loop case because we added something in the feedback. In this case, a unity gain feedback. So just to compare it with the open loop, notice that our poles have moved towards the left-hand side as compared to the open loop. So in open loop, it was to the right side of minus one. In this case, it's exactly at minus one, which signifies that we made the system a little bit more stable, which is a good thing, right? Awesome, let's move on. Now let's move on to a simple feedback control, which is basically proportional control, also known as P-control, or it can also be called as linear proportional control, because in this case, everything is linear. Note that I took the liberty to combine the two blocks of the controller and the plant into one. So because the controller just has a single gain KP, and this plant had G of S, we just combined it together and we again continue with the unity gain feedback like i said before if a system had a sensor function h of s in the bottom you can easily convert into unity gain feedback there are a lot of control systems which talk about that and this g of s would be manifested to have an h of s inside and i'm not going to talk about that that's feel free to read about it so let's continue with the same example so we have g of s as the same thing s plus 1 divided by s squared plus s plus 4 and g total which is comb a combination of the whole thing would basically be kp into g of s divided by 1 plus kp into g of s let's assume that kp is 2 choose any value you want and this graph is plotted for kp is equal to 2 so g total of s would be something like this 
and know that here the poles have moved even to the left hand side, even more to the left hand side. Now it's to the left hand side of minus one, which is good. So this is more stable than the unity gain feedback, which is sort of obvious because now we are controlling it linearly as a function of the error too, which is nice. So let's move on. Now let's come to the little bit more complicated version of proportional control, which is also known as proportional derivative control or PD control. In this case, we have a proportional term and we have a derivative term. If you convert KD into S into time domain, you would see that it would be D by DT of the error signal, which is basically in Laplacian domain, it just becomes a simple multiplication. And again, I took the liberty to combine the two blocks as before. And as mentioned before, you can convert any non-unity feedback to unity feedback following some simple control system literature. Let's move on with the example. So as you would observe, here, g of s is s plus 1 divided by s squared plus s plus 4, as before. And g total would basically be as shown in the figure. And the poles have been plotted here. Uh, note that uh, kd is just assumed to be 1 here. And it doesn't have to be the ideal value. And we would actually need to tune the value of both kp and kd such that we could get a more stable system. In this case, because it's not super tuned, this made it a little bit more unstable than the KP system as the poles have moved. But the, yep, so that's that's the idea. So, but of course, these are not tuned values, so you need to tune the value of KP and KD to get good responses. So as we will see later that the adding of the derivative term makes the system more stable in terms of it would reduce the overshoot. We'll talk about it soon in maybe about five slides. Okay, let's move on to proportional integral derivative control. In this case, the idea is that we have the whole system function as kp plus kd into s plus ki divided by s. What does one by s mean? One by s just means that it's the integral of the error. So the idea is this integral part sees how the error has been varying over time. The derivative part sees or predicts what my error is gonna be, the momentum in the error. And KP just linearly sees how far am I with the error and linearly go, is going to scale ac ac accord, the value according to my error signal. And that's shown here. So as I said before, the time domain control output would be something like this. So it'd be something like KP into E of T plus KI into integral 0 to T E of tau D tau plus KD into DET by DT. That's the idea. So again, same, same thing as before. And I'm assuming that KD and KI are both one. Note that these are not tuned values and the pole zero plot is shown here. Note that most important thing, note that here would be proportional, proportional uh, derivative and proportional integral derivative, P, PD and PID, all the control systems are more stable than the open loop system and generally more stable than the unity gain feedback. Note that we can always have wacky gains or weird gains which could make the system more unstable and it's not super intuitive how this would be. So we will come to that in the next few slides of how to tune this intuitively. I have not explained that yet. Okay, so now that this animation shows you how changing the value of KP, KI and KD would affect the system response. Know that increasing the KP made the system faster. That is, it would respond to the system step input faster. That is here we commanded at time t is equal to zero that we want to be at one volt or one unit in signal. And the more towards the left the blue curve is, the better it is or the faster the system responses. And we would formally talk about some parameters of these things, but just take a moment to observe this slide two, three times just to see what's happening intuitively. Uh, this slide basically talks about what are the most important parameters we would need in order to tune the gains of a system. So at time t is equal to zero, we said that the output of the system should be at one. This is shown by the step input or the desired step output at uh, with the blue solid line. And the red curve basically shows the response of the system. The idea is that uh, the thing, the area defined in green, basically 
from rise time start to rise time stop is basically defined as the rise time that is going from 10% of the ideal value to the 90% of the ideal value in this case it will be 0.1 to 0.9 is defined as a rise time you want this rise time to be as fast as possible or the value should be small and the peak overshoot is basically the maximum value the difference between the maximum value the system output achieves with respect to the reference value in this case this is the point of peak overshoot and you want this value to be as small as possible because you don't want the system let's say if it's a quad order you don't and you command it to go from zero to one you don't want it to go to three meters and hit the ceiling that's the idea settling time basically is defined as the time which basically after after the after which the system output is bounded to some threshold with respect to the reference reference value in, th in this case it would be 2 or 5 percent and we have chosen 2 percent which is 0 0.02 as the reference output value is 1. Okay let's move on to the next slide. Okay so let's give a physical intuition of what these PID controls mean. Let's assume we have a quad order as shown here with denoted with R of t. R of t here is x, y and z as a time parameterized quantity and the desired state is R desired which is shown in the yellow quad order here or the ghost quad order here. Let's say that this is one sample point along the series of trajectory points shown by the black dotted lines and the error in position basically would be the vector between RT and R desired of t or the other way around we could define it however we want right uh, that's shown here and basically we have the velocities of these two ideal quadrotor and the real quadrotor as shown in yellow and red respectively and also denoted by r dot desired for the ideal and r dot of t for the actual and because these are vectors we can literally take the vector difference and this would be the error in velocity of t why is this important this is important because this sort of acts like a predictor of where the ideal quadrotor should be going uh, should be going and where we are going with respect to that and it would take the difference of that and it would use that to smooth out the way we are moving this would be important because if we want to make sudden changes to direction this would come in handy with respect to that uh, the first part which was e position basically relates to the proportional term or kp and e velocity which refers to the difference in error in velocity it relates to the KD term or the derivative term. The integral term basically measures the amount of error changed over time. Let's say we have E position as a function of time. We want to find the area under this curve, the way this is varying. So take a moment, pause this video and think about when this case would happen wherein the error would linearly increase. I'm not going to give an answer to that, but it's a problem for you to think about. So, now let's move on and uh, see some examples of what a simulation of a quad order would happen if the gains are good or really bad. So let's start with a good one. So if we tune the tune, uh, gains well and it's a stable system, you would see something like this. Here the quad order was commanded to go in the z direction to 1 meters. Note that uh, also the output response has a little bit of overshoot. Why this is so? This is because we want the system to respond fast and we are going to trade off a little bit of overshoot for a fast response. Note that the, sim the actual simulation, the number of seconds the simulation took is not directly proportional to the actual simulation time. The actual simulation time is shown on the top here which is 1.35. So just observe this value. The reason why the simulation is not running in exact same time is because of the number of processes running in the background and also because how the ordinary differential equation solver works and it depends upon the values of the inputs and so on. So I'm not going to get into that details but that's for you if you want to understand how that is slow. And this is exactly the same solver which you will be using in your projects and you might observe something like that. So don't worry about the actual number of seconds your code takes but more about what this value time here shows and the number of iterations. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So this is a marginally stable system or more formally called as critically uh, 
stable system wherein the system continues to oscillate with which the oscillations are not damped or neither increasing they are just at the same standard amplitude so let's observe this clearly the system is oscillating from 0 to 2 which is one unit above the desired response and one unit below the desired response note that the value of amplitude will of course depend upon your gain and so on uh, take a moment pause this video and think about what this case could be the answer is here there was no derivative gain used so that's what this gives us right now let's look at an unstable system what would happen please do not try tuning gains on the real quadrotor because it could be really dangerous and the quadrotor could crash causing a lot of damage and also harm to you so please don't try to tune these gains the general way we actually tune the gains is basically tune it in a very good simulator first with actual values from the real quadrotor which we'll be giving you for the project but that's one thing to learn about and after doing that we would tie down the quadrotor and then try to tune the real one and once we are sure that it's a little bit stable we try to do it in the real world okay let's look at this video note that with super wacky gains the quadrotor starts to diverge that is it, the oscillation keeps increasing in time so take a moment to pause this video and see how we could create this very easily the answer is I use the negative KD to get this scenario. Okay, let's move on. Again, with very well tuned system or good gains, we have the same response as we saw before. We have a little bit of overshoot, just trading it off for faster response, and the system is stable. Let's move on to the next one. This is good gains or a stable system too. It's the same thing. Next, let's see an overdamped system. Note that overdamp system though converges, it's super sluggish. That means it takes a lot of time to reach. Note that here I have avoided overshoot, but the system response has become much slower at 1.9 seconds as compared to 1.4 in the last one. So the way I did this was I used a high KD. So if you observe a response like this, you need to put your KD value down or increase your KP value higher. So that's the idea here. Uh, note that this might be useful in some cases where you would you cannot tolerate some response wherein you have a little bit of overshoot maybe this is good so that's the idea okay this is an underdamp system note that for an underdamp system the value of your peak overshoot is very large you don't want this this is a super undesirable response uh, and the system oscillates a lot longer so you never would want this so the way i generated this was with the low value of kd okay now let's see how we could tune these parameters manually uh, that's not one of the most simplest ways to do it but is generally intuitive and that's why people like PID controllers so if we increase any of these values that is KP KD or AI we see these these effect on the parameters that is if we increase KP we see a drop in rise time as we discussed before and KD does not affect the rise time and if we increase KI that also decreases the rise time and as we increase KP the peak overshoot increases as proportional to KP as we discussed before and increasing in KD decreases the peak overshoot because it dampens it out and increase in KI also increases the peak overshoot so you would observe that KP and KI generally have the similar effect and KP increase or decrease does not affect settling time or increase in KD decreases the settling time which makes it reach the convergence faster uh, and increase in KI increases the settling time though it tries to make it more accurate which is the next point so increase in kp decreases the steady state error uh, kd does not affect steady state error and increase in ki or 
doesn't have to be increased as long as you have some ki the steady state error will eventually become zero note that with a just pd system you might never achieve uh, steady state error of zero in theory you can never do it but in practice you might that's the idea so there is a more formal method for tuning these systems which is called ziegler nicol system Uh, let's talk about ziegler nichols method, which is a more formal method for tuning the control gains. It's a little bit more formal than the hacky manual method of tuning. So the easiest way to start is set the derivative and the integral gains to zero in the beginning, and then try to increase Kp until we reach oscillatory system. And at this oscillatory system state, measure the gain, which is Ku, and basically you can also measure the time period of the oscillations this is tu and we can set the time uh, the gains as follows for proportional control proportional integral control proportional derivative control proportional integral derivative control and so on so just take a moment pause the video look at the slides and this is generally a very formal way of tuning pid Note that these gains are just a mere starting point and they might not work perfectly for the system you're using. So, but it gives you a very formal method to start off with a good set of gains so that we can fine tune later. The fine tuning is generally done through the manual method we discussed before, which is more trial and error. Okay. Now let's look at the higher level picture for the control systems in the next slide, which is this. So the idea here is that we have a trajectory planner, which gives us the desired trajectories this could be a trajectory planner running on top of a Dijkstra or an A-star algorithm which you guys implemented in project one phase one and the trajectory planner is what you'll be implementing in phase three this is the middle picture which is phase two so we have a position controller which controls the position or this is also called as the outer loop controller that is where we want to be in which space at which time that's what is controlled by this position controller. The trajectory planner just gives us the trajectories as a time parameterized quantity. And the everything which is in green is basically the inner loop controller. More specifically, attitude controller is called the inner loop controller. Note that there is a order of magnitude difference or order of two magnitudes of difference between the inner loop controller and outer loop controller. The inner loop controller runs much faster than the outer loop controller. This approach of control system design is called backstepping and you can you're welcome to read about more about what backstepping is and how it works later in this course and we are not going to talk about why we use backstepping but just know that this concept is borrowed from the standard general concept of backstepping from control system design so let's move on the same quarter picture as before is shown here okay so let's define something called as the nominal hover state before. The conditions are that R, R which is basically X, Y, Z, is fixed at some R0. Note that these are the ideal hover state, which is you want to stay at the exact same position and not move about. So, and theta and phi are basically zero. And so cos theta and cos phi basically become approximately one, and sine theta and sine phi approximately become theta and phi respectively. Next, r dot, which is velocity, is zero because we are not moving, right? And our angle angle derivatives are zero because we are also not moving, or angle velocity is zero because we are not rotating, pitching, rolling, or yaw. That's the idea. At this state, the thrust force is given as mg divided by four because the total thrust is mg. That is the quadrotor has weight acting downwards, which is being pulled down by the gravity. Thrust is acting upwards and these two exactly cancel each other out. And recall from before that force is kf into omega square. And so omega can be obtained as mass and gravity as follows. So note that we are using Euler notation zxy Euler angles here. So that's color coded in most of the slides and we try to stick to this convention where x is red y is green and uh, blue is z okay back to the higher level picture let's focus more about the attitude controller now before that recall that the angular velocity so body frame angular velocity is r transpose r dot 
where r transpose r dot are the rotation matrices. For z, x, y Euler angles are as parameterized before, we have the body frame angular velocity omega b, which is p, q, and r for x, y, and z coordinates as shown here, where omega dot, theta dot, and phi dot are roll, pitch, uh, roll rate, pitch rate, and yaw rate as shown, which is in the world or inertial frame as before. Uh, if you don't recall the slides, please go back and uh, refer to the velocity lecture where we derived this. So now let's talk about attitude control. Recall the Euler's equation from the dynamics slides. If you don't remember this, please go back and watch the dynamics slides. Note that again, PQR are angular velocities with respect to x, y, and z direction. And now assume that we have an x, y symmetric quad order, which is because of the x configuration. And this also assumes that there is no pitching in the quad rotor blades, uh, which we will be talking about in the next next point. And the diag and assume that the moment of inertia is diagonal, which again in turn in turn states that there is no quad rotor blades which are pitching upwards or downwards because there are some quad rotors which are built like that for aggressive maneuvers. Which because in this course we are not dealing with aggressive maneuvers, let's just assume this for the time being. And these are the equations which we will get from the top equation. So take a moment, try to derive this if it's not clear, or ask questions in class. Assuming that the velocity in the ZB direction, which is the vertical direction, r is equal to zero or is small, we would get this from the previous equation, which is super, super intuitive and clear. Let's move on. So recall that gamma was Kf by Km. And we had p dot, q dot, and r dot defined as follows from the previous slide as shown here. And we also assume that r is approximately 0, so that's why we get this, these equations. Note that we can use a PD control law at the nominal hover state as shown in this equation. So that is p dot is the commanded thing, and we have kp into the angular error and plus kd into the angular velocity error which is what was the intuition we discussed before. And same thing for Q and R. So take a moment, pause the video, talk, uh, think about why this is so. So this is just an attitude controller to track trajectories in SO3 or angles that are close to the nominal hover state where the roll and pitch angles are very small. So know that we are not concerned about yaw here, only pitch and roll, because that is what considers about X and Y rotation as we talked about before. So we want to compute the U desired, uh, which is basically what control input we should give. Uh, that is given by these equations, which were derived in the dynamic slides before. So they're color coded for ease of use. Note that we only talked about the PD control law here because it's sufficient for these ca this case. Uh, we can also use a PID controller. Feel free to implement one for the project if you want to. Okay, now let's talk about the higher level picture. It's back to the higher level picture. Now let's talk about the position controller. The attitude controller assumes that we can stabilize at any small angle approximation wherein roll and pitch angles are small. That is at given any angle like this or like this or like this, we can maintain the angle. That's what the attitude controller is doing. But that does not determine how we are tracking the trajectories, right? So that is the quarter wants to go from here to here. So you want to change the angle like this and move. So that is not being controlled by the attitude controller. All the attitude controller is doing is, at this time, if my angle is this, I want to be stable at this angle and not just wobble about. That's what the attitude controller is doing. So that's to put it out there. For the position control, uh, let's talk about a hover controller, which maintains the position at a desired x, y, z. So U1 basically controls the z axis, which is basically the thrust, right? That controls at what height my quad rotor is hovering. U2 x and U2 y control the roll and pitch ang angles, and U2 z controls the yaw angle. That's the idea. And the 3D trajectory controller tracks the trajectory in 3D, that is, how do I go from here to here and how do I track it? Attitude controller, like I said before, maintains the given attitude, which in turn is given by the position controller. That's the roll and pitch, which is going to be computed by the position controller. Position controller can be thought of as an amalgamation of both hover controller, 
and the 3D trajectory controller like we said before. Cool. Let's move on. Now let RT of T be the position traject of the trajectory, which is the capital T denotes the trajectory, and psi of t basically defines the yaw angle, be the trajectory in the ang yaw angle as we discussed before. Now let's assume that for our case, the yaw angle is always fixed at some psi naught, which could be something like zero. The reason why this is so because we, whenever we change yaw, it upsets the control system a little bit. So in order to avoid that, and because we are not doing any aggressive maneuvers, we can assume safely that the yaw can be fixed in our case. So the PID feedback of the position error, in this case the error would just basically be the difference between the ideal trajectory error and the current position we are at to calculate the acceleration of the desired value. And just take a moment, pause this video and see how this control law holds good. Note that for your project you can implement a simple PID controller and it doesn't have to be a PID controller. Though this is the equation for the full PID controller. PID controller, if tuned well, would always give you better results than a PID controller. It would give you a little bit more faster response and more accurate response because the integral term takes your error, uh, residual error to zero. Cool. Let's continue with the whole controller. Recall, recall the Newton's Euler equations of motion. If you don't remember this, again, please go back to the dynamic slide and revise this. Now, linearizing this equation, we can easily say that the delta theta and delta phi are small and psi t in this case if we assume from the previous slice is fixed the cosine and the sine values are just going to be constants and we would have these equations for the control law. If you don't understand how this is linearized please read about linearization in differential equations and try to re re linearize this by hand and RAB is the Euler angle representation ZXY as we discussed before. So now let's talk about a simple error metric, simple being in quotes, because it's not that simple. The trajectory controller to track trajectories. So assume that the near hover assumptions hold, that the angles are small. The idea is we have the world frame as before, denoted by red, and we have the body frame denoted by blue as before. And we want to measure the difference in error to the desired trajectory and see how much we have to correct by it to move on to the desired trajectory. Let's say, we have the R desired value as R desired. In this case, is the same thing as RT, or at that particular time instead T. And we have the actual position as R. Let's say this position is obtained by some external localization system, or we are running some onboard algorithms to get these values. So more details about this will come into the project too, where you would estimate your own pose, how you would understand how this actually works. For now, you can just assume that an oracle gives you this position or orientation or vector, right? Okay, so literally we just take at every time instant, we just measure the error. So pause for a minute and think about what the issues of this simple error metric can be. Of course, let's say we have a quadrotor and we have an ideal trajectory like we want to go in the square. But the criteria here is that we shouldn't stop because if we stop, of course, we can execute this trajectory, we can take infinite time. We want to do execute this trajectory as fast as possible. If the PID is not tuned well, or that is it's overdamped, it would undershoot something like this. It would be the orange trajectory. Or if it's tuned in a really bad way where it would uh, it is underdamped, it would overshoot like the blue curve. So both are not good. And if we get lucky and we have an amazing tuning person, we would get a realistic trajectory. Observe that the realistic trajectory is still not perfect. It's close to perfect, but it's still not perfect. That's the issue with the simple error metric because you always are playing, trying to play a, a, a cat and mouse game with the trajectory because if you are a little bit slow, you'll always be a little bit slow and it would accumulate over time. And if you're fast, you're always fast and it should accumulate over time. Unless it's perfectly tuned, which is super hard to do. And every time you crash a quad order, the gains will change because the physical system has changed. And the system is not linear with respect to the battery voltage and so on. So it becomes super hard to use this simple error metric. Now that for simulation, this would suffice. But what we would recommend is using a more fancier 3D trajectory controller, which 
basically calculates the error as projected onto the normal and binormal directions, uh, neglecting the tangent direction and only considering normal and binormal direction as, as shown here. Note that here b hat is not the same as the body frame, it's the binormal direction. We'll define what it is soon. Same world frame as before, same desired trajectory, and we have the quad rotor. At the position r and r desired here is not the same as rt because r desired is computed basically by dropping a perpendicular onto the plane made by the normal and by bi binormal terms. Uh, normal and binormal terms are the two normal vectors to the tangential direction of your trajectory. What does this say? This says basically how much we are off in th this ta in the normal direction and the binormal direction. Not in the tangential direction because tangential direction has to do with the simple error metric we talked about before. And the position in error is given just by these vector components projections and the summation of the normal and the binomial term. Know that if needed we can always weigh these terms and the error in velocity is literally the difference between the velocity vectors and the control command is given as follows. If you don't understand why this is, please pause the video and think about this super intuitive trajectory controller. And this is all the controls you would need to control a simple quad rotor which executes near hover conditions and executes simple trajectories and we are not doing any aggressive maneuvers. Do some aggressive maneuvers, we would of course need more nonlinear controllers which we are not going to be talking in this course but you're feel, you can feel free to read about them. One of them is linear quadratic controller or quadratic regulator and LQG, LQR and you can also use multiple PIDs at different states tuned and this is also called gain scheduling. And there are more nonlinear and adaptive controllers which is beyond the scope of this course and you can always take controls or an advanced controls course to talk about that more. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.